This special is brought to you by Allerest, created for allergy and only for allergy. <laughs> Allerest calms the cough, the sneeze, the tears, the runny nose, the itchy eye of allergy. <laughs> Allerest tablets, a product of Pharmacraft Laboratories. Believe me, it wasn't easy getting back on television. It really, it wasn't. I lied to them. I told them I was a doctor. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I've been pretty busy this past year. Nightclubs, motion pictures, theaters. I went to all of them. <laughs> but I, I don't have to worry. What do I... I have a 30-year contract with NBC, really. 30 years. And the lawyer who drew it up for me got the same sentence. <laughs> tell you one thing, though. Really, I gotta tell you this. I think television hasn't changed since I had my own series. Really, they had the same panel shows. You know, like to tell the truth. You know, where the moderator says, will the real David Suskind please shut up? <laughs> Big deal to tell the truth. They've had a show like that in Russia for years. They let you tell the truth about anything between the time the bullet leaves the rifle and hits you. <laughs> Take this country anytime. American television is the only place in the world where you can find at least 50 shows in the top 10. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I can't wait till pay television comes in. It's practically here. I really mean, I know that. Because I had to pay plenty to get this show. <laughs> well, I want to say, pay TV will be great. There'll be no more reruns. Reruns, you know what that is? That's a Madison Avenue talk for the old saying, the evil that men do lives after them. <laughs> There's only one thing that's holding up pay TV. They can't decide how much Dr. Kildare should charge for a house call. <laughs> and that's the big thing this year, medical shows. Ben Casey, Dr. Kildare. I, I remember in the old days when you were sick, you used to have to go to the Mayo Brothers. Today you've got to go to... <laughs> and those 
medical shows are even affecting our hospitals. I mean that. If something goes wrong on the operating table, the surgeon takes off his mask, turns to his assistant and says, well, that's showbiz. <laughs> you think that's bad? Oh, I just remind did you see the trouble they had the other night on the Ben Casey show? A man went in for a tonsillectomy, and instead, Casey took out his appendix. <laughs> Somebody mixed up the cue card. <laughs> you like that, right? you like that. There's one thing that I can't understand. With all those medical shows on television, how come Chester still limps? <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I am not complaining about television. The industry, this industry does its best. For example, every year one night is put aside to present the Emmy Awards. Emmy Awards, that's the night that the public finds out they've been enjoying the wrong shows. <laughs> and the categories. You ever listen to some of those titles? There's one called the award for the best writing of an hour or a half hour show in a continuing series or a special event film or live, but not taped, syndicated or sponsored, black and white, or in color, with or without music, not previously adapted from any magazine, novel, short story, true incident, motion picture, Broadway play, or condensed from a spectacular. <laughs> this award will be given to the writer who wrote that description. What did you turn it off for? very funny tonight. Funny? He couldn't get a laugh on TV if he was run over by car 54. <laughs> but you liked it when he did that dramatic show, Doyle Against the House, when he played the blackjack dealer and they broke both his hands. Yeah, that I laughed at. <laughs> now, if you don't mind, I'm going to push this remote control button and change the channel. Do you know why? Why? Jack Benny is on the other network. Jack Benny? Oh, no, you're not. Give me that button. We're going to watch Burl. I want to see Jack Benny. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Jack Benny program. And here's our star, Jack Benny. So, wait a minute. If he starts talking about his age again, I'm going to switch back to Burl. Oh, shut up, will you? <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You know, before getting out with my show tonight, I want to discuss something personal. You know, a lot of people have been kidding me about my age, and I'd like to straighten them out. This morning, I want to tell you, I played golf at Hillcrest. I'm a pretty good golfer, too. For instance, the first hole was a par three, and on that first hole, I shot a... 39. <laughs> now, that's... That's how old I was on my last birthday. As a matter of fact, recently a Hollywood producer had a part open for a young, good-looking fella for one of his pictures, you see. So my agent brought me over there, and my agent pointed to me, and he said, if you're looking for a, a good, a good-looking young leading man, I'd advise you to sign Jack Parr. <laughs> Really, I, I shot uh, two under par in the second hole. But when I approached the third tee, I hit the ball. And would you believe it, I got a hole <laughs> in your head. <laughs> it's all in the mind. <laughs> because, just because I've been in the public's eye for all these years. Actually, I only started in radio 30 years ago, when I was nine. <laughs> and uh, that was the biggest lie you ever heard. <laughs> Tell you, you see, most golfers are lying. No, not me, not Burl. I tell the truth about my game. In fact, what do you think happened to me this afternoon? I'm a great golfer. I lost the ball on the green. <laughs> Other guy, I put down the bag and we'll look for the ball. When I come back, the bag was gone. <laughs> Somebody took her away. <laughs> funny, funny joke. I just, just made it up. Really, I just made it up. Now, to, to prove it to you, uh, here is a... I must read this. Here's a copy of the first radio show, first script I did 30 years ago. And I'll get a load of this. I was playing golf one day, and I lost my ball on the green. I put down the bag and went to look for the ball. When I got back, the bag was gone. Somebody took her away. You know, I can't imagine anyone, I mean, having the gall to do a joke like that today. Maybe one. Anyway, I'm getting off the subject about my age. You see, I believe a man is as old as he feels, and I feel just wonderful. Because, you see, I know I'm in good physical condition because 
About a week ago, I went to see my doctor. I went up to his office for an examination. And he looked at my tonsils. <laughs> That's where I found it. <laughs> I, I was pretty mad at this girl because she disappeared from the golf course. So I walked right up to her and I said, <laughs> Take off your clothes. <laughs> Well, after the, uh, after the doctor made me undress, he started to examine, he checked my heart and my lungs, and he said to me, uh, Jack, as far as I can see, you're a uh, very beautiful girl. <laughs> you know, that night it was great. I, I took this girl to the restaurant. It was wonderful. We had a great dinner, but when I wanted to sign to check the waiter, he wanted cash. I guess he didn't recognize me, so I got mad. I said to him, I'm Milton Burl. Milton Burl. <laughs> which can upset anyone's stomach. <laughs> then my doctor told me, he said, I had nothing to worry about because I was in excellent condition. And of course, this made me feel very, very good, particularly because Mary just recently gave me a party for my birthday. Oh, I, I knew there was something I forgot to tell you. Will you hold the music last? Will you hold it just a minute? You know, Jack Benny, very good friend of mine, he just had a birthday, and you should see what I sent him. It's a beautiful gift that, that I know he'll appreciate because it's something that he's always wanted. But I got one gift that was absolutely fabulous. Now, I don't know how to describe it to you, see? so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have to show it to you. Will you bring it in, fellas, please? <laughs> Isn't this wonderful? How I ever lived all my life without it, I'll never know. <laughs> and look at, look at the inscription on it, right here. It says, to Jack, in appreciation for the many wonderful hours of entertainment, you got from watching me. <laughs> Isn't that adorable? <laughs> Wait a minute, I, I gotta tell you something. I heard a joke this afternoon, it's, it's terrific. It's about a spy in the days of King Arthur. Let's see if I can remember. He was brought down to this torture chamber and he was threatened with the most horrible instrument of torture ever invented. My violin. <laughs> I want you to know that this is a genuine Stradivarius, which I was very fortunate in purchasing while he was still alive. <laughs> and now I would like to play Cole Porter's Never To Be Forgotten Night and Day. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, just I want to show you, for the first time on television, I'd like to play the harmonica. <laughs> you didn't think I could play it, huh? <laughs> when you want to listen? <laughs> Tuning up, partner. Gentlemen, I'm going to play Cole Porter's Never to Be Forgotten Night and Day. Okay, Les. Uh, ready? Music, please. <laughs> This is Milwaukee, population 741,000. A beautiful Midwestern city, thriving, bustling, growing, sneezing. For 45 years, it has been in a state of war. This is the enemy, Ambrosia trifida. You call it ragweed. It triggers hay fever. 10 grains of pollen from this plant 
and a cubic yard of air can start you sneezing. And a single ragweed plant can produce 8 billion grains of pollen. 8 billion grains. Enough pollen to start every hay fever sufferer in the world sneezing from just one plant. And ragweed is everywhere. It invaded Milwaukee as it invaded thousands of towns. Surrounded it, smothered it. Let's see what Milwaukee did about it. My name is Elliot Duke. I'm a news reporter. Milwaukee has been fighting ragweed for 45 years. Take a look at these clippings. The mayor endorses weed eradication days. A hay fever clinic is set up. And a hospital sets aside special rooms for hay fever sufferers. Milwaukee newspapers have given strong support for weed cutting drives. The Milwaukee Boys Club joined in these weed cutting drives. Laws were passed. It became a crime to fail to cut down ragweed on your property. Milwaukee even has a weed commissioner. In his words, this city has a real weed problem. These are weeds. Weeds, more weeds. So we post notices, we notify owners. Then we move in with machinery to cut down the weeds before they can spread pollen. Last year, Milwaukee destroyed over 80 million square feet of weeds. It cost many thousands of dollars to do it. That's how Milwaukee, an energetic and progressive city, gets rid of 90% of its ragweed. And yet, every summer from August 15th to September 15th, Milwaukee sneezes. Why? Because pollen is so light, the wind blows it in from hundreds of miles around. The hay fever story is the same all over the country. In California, the enemy might be sage. In New England, Timothy. But in Milwaukee, it's ragweed. So if you lived in Milwaukee and had hay fever, you went away to resorts like Eagle River or to Sturgeon Bay. Expensive. Or you stayed at home and tried to get through the season. And you sneezed. But last summer, many Milwaukeeans could stay home without sneezing. A new anti-hay fever product appeared in Milwaukee drugstores. It cost only a dollar and a quarter a bottle. This tablet was made specifically for hay fever and similar allergies. Its name is Alarest. And Alarest is the tablet that made Milwaukee stop sneezing. And now, folks, it's my pleasure to present to you one of the loveliest, one of the most dynamic performers in the entertainment world today, the fantastic Janice Page.
Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Cool off, and I'll see you later. Oh, uh, stay the way you are. And... You know, ladies and gentlemen, it's not very often that I get a chance to introduce a personality with the talent and the creative ability. The, pardon me. <laughs> With the talent and creative... I'm so nervous introducing him. With the talent and creative ability of our next guest, he's America's artistic import from Great Britain and is really to be congratulated for his magnificent performance in Summer and Smoke. My pleasure to present to you Mr. Lawrence Harvey, ladies and gentlemen. You notice how you notice how tongue-tied I get. I get nervous, and I want to tell you something. It's a great pleasure, Larry, to have you on our show. I really mean that. Well, thank you, Mo. You know, I'm, you, you know, you know how nervous I got introduced. And I, well, I tell you, I'm I'm so impressed just standing on the same stage with you. After all, you're one of one of the real artists in our profession. You mean you are in my profession? <laughs> Mr. Harvey, I uh, know that you're not used to the uh, customs of this country, but we have one rule in TV television, American television over here, FCC Regulation 22. You never heard of it? The guest never gets more laughs than the comedian. <laughs> You'll remember that, won't you, from now on, please? Well, I, I'm terribly sorry. I didn't know. You see, I've only been in this country, well, just a little over two years. Only two years, and it's amazing. <laughs> he speaks English better than I do. <laughs> Uh, you, I'm kidding. You, you like it here, though? You really like it? Oh, very much. You know, except that I've been so busy since I've been here. Interviews, cocktail parties, autograph hounds, yeah. work, personal yeah. appearances, attending premieres. Yeah, yeah, it's tough being a celebrity, isn't it? It certainly is. You're not missing a thing. <laughs> Lawrence, you are forgetting Regulation 22. You know <laughs> You know, I've always admired you. I really, I mean, that when I was a kid, I, I, I couldn't make up my mind whether to be a dramatic actor or a comedian. <laughs> Which did you finally decide on? I thought... <laughs> Lawrence, will you please don't start anything I can't finish. <laughs> so, so, please, don't make fun of me, will you please? Milton, Milton what? look, I'm not making fun well, of I you. Well, I thought you were just... No, put... really, seriously, look, as you say in this country... I was only putting you on. You know all the lines already. Oh, putting yes. you on and putting you on stick. everything. You know, <laughs> what, what do you think I've been doing here for the last two years? Listen, is it? I can say last two. In fact, you know, <laughs> you know, I did see you in a drama. Oh, he knows the camera pretty no, no. good. This kid. Go ahead. <laughs> you saw me what? I did see you in a drama. It was on the Dick Powell show, Doyle Against the Heart. Yeah. You were magnificent. Oh, really? I really, you know, honestly, I really feel you should get an Emmy for that performance. Oh, Larry, are you, are you saying that sincerely? Why, yes. Isn't that the way you told me to say it? Yeah, I... <laughs> just, just to forget the whole bit. Don't laugh so loud. All right, I, I just thought maybe, you know, uh, about pictures. You're I, I mm -hmm. thought maybe I could be your co-star with you in the new picture you're doing. Uh, I, I read it in, the, uh, in the, one of the papers. Of trade. What's the name of the picture? The Manchurian Candidate. Manchurian Candidate. I, if I could be in that picture, it would be great. I'm terribly sorry, Mark. You why? see, it's too late. We already have a co-star. Who's that? Frank Sinatra. I see. What are you doing in fix you? Well, we play uh, American soldiers in Korea. Sinatra, a soldier? He doesn't weigh uh, enough to be a bullet. <laughs> and I nearly loused up my own joke, I'll tell you. <laughs> May I? Why, why do you always... Why do you always use Sinatra? Well, can't, every, no, Sinatra, no, Sinatra, Sinatra. Milton, 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 can you blame them? Why? Well, using Frank in a picture, that's like money in the bank. Oh, I see what you mean. Does somebody call me? I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Larry, you know Jack Benny, don't you, Jack? Yes, oh, sure. hello, Jack. Hello, nice Larry. How are you? I'm so glad that you're here, too, because this gives me an opportunity to compliment you on your performance in the Alamo. Thank you. What a wonderful picture. You know, I'd, I'd have given anything to have been in that picture. Anything. Sure, he'd made a fortune selling ladders to the Mexicans. <laughs> selling ladders to Mexicans, selling ladders to Mexicans. I sold one, and he makes a big thing. <laughs> you know, Larry, one thing I've always noticed, though, you get the most exciting leading ladies for your pictures, like Simone Signore. Is that the way you pronounce it? Mm -hmm. Signore. Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, what, do you, what do you attribute that to? A sexy agent. <laughs> Beautiful. Funny, funny, funny. You, no, thank, no, thank, thank, when you thank, do a joke on him, I laugh. Thank you. I mean, I mean, you know, look, no, seriously, this is ironic. What? Here you two are complimenting me when I should be complimenting you. I don't understand what you're talking about. Well, look, here I am, standing on the same stage with, with two of America's greatest comedians, 
And you know, to be a comedian is much, much tougher than being just a dramatic actor. Oh, sure. Why, I'd give anything to learn how to do comedy. I'd even be willing to start at the bottom. <laughs> you certainly picked the right program. <laughs> Jack, will you please? Now, Larry, if you're really serious, I can teach you. I've gave, I gave lots of comedians their nightclub material. Really? Like Mort Saul, Henny Youngman, Buddy Hackett, Jan Murray. You gave them their joke? That's right. Yes, he gave Mort Saul Youngman's material. He gave Youngman Hackett. Oh, shut material. up, will you? <laughs> That's not true, Jack. Now, you know me very well. I don't steal jokes. I'm an ad-lib comedian. Some ad-lib comedian. Yeah. You could lean against a stove and something, I'm supposed to <laughs> If you leaned against the stove, you couldn't get a blister. No, no, no. You couldn't have a blister if you leaned against a hot stove. No, no, no. I got it. I got it. I got it. You got it. That's very funny. I'm letting you do all the funny lines. That's what yeah. <laughs> yeah, you are. Something must be bothering you. Nothing is bothering you, Jack. I don't like that, you know, insinuation that I can't ad-lib. I defy anyone to name a better ad-libber than me. Anyone. Well, Milton, there's um, Bob Hope, Red Skelton, Groucho Marx. That's not fair. You're naming comedians. <laughs> you could throw in Arthur Murray and it would still come out the same. <laughs> Never mind. Now, Larry, come here. Step down. It's very... You're upstaging me. It's, um, it's very simple. If you want to learn how to do comedy, you don't have to make up your mind who you want to teach it. Jack and I are different types. That's the sweetest thing he said to me all day. <laughs> now, please, Jack, I'm talking about styles. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, and you know he's right about that, about the style. Now, I think you, you see, Larry, with your, you know, you're being so suave, that uh, I think that you should work like I do. You know, I, I think Jack has something there. Sure, he has something every place. He never gives anything away. <laughs> you, can, you can bet me. Oh, no, Milton, that's not fair. I happen to know that Jack is not cheap. I'm not? I mean, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I don't know why anyone ever accuses you of always thinking of money. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's right. I mean, money is never on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> it would be if you had a pocket there. <laughs> Dennis. Now, look at Yeah. Look at, Larry. Sorry to wake you up. <laughs> yeah, now. it's all right. <laughs> Larry. Now, I, I think. Will you know, hurry I, up? I, I will. I, I, I got to be on the set thing, in May. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one thing he's right about, though. I mean, you're, with your sophistication and everything, you should adopt my style. Really. You well, really should. Why? You think your style's funny? Will you pardon me just a minute? Are you being on the level with him? Yeah. What's so funny? Will you pardon me just a minute? I'll be with you in an hour. <laughs> do you, do you, what's so funny about you? Pardon me. What's so... You didn't mean to serve. <laughs> what's so... Oh, I got a line here, but I don't want to say it. Because it isn't mine. Now. <laughs> Well, I'm going to explain. What's so funny about your style anyway, Jack? You stand there in front of an audience on your own show, and I watch you with your arms crossed, and you look at the camera and you say, Well! <laughs> now, what do you got to say about that? Hmm. <laughs> and the way you walk. Did you ever see the way you walk? You walk like... I walk nice. You walk like... <laughs> Yes, you know what you look like? You look like Heine Gingo wearing Tuesday Wells blue jeans. But <laughs> long as we're on the subject, did you ever watch yourself on the, the way you walk? Oh, I walk very cute. Yeah. Oh, you walk cute. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good, 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 good. Oh, yeah. No, no. You sound like a Russian. No, no, no. When you walk, you look like a sore loser in a twist contest. <laughs> I tell 40, and I get big laughs. You get, yeah. you get bigger laughs big than I... Laughs. You get bigger I, laughs. You I, never I get bigger laughs. I would, now, never. now, cut that out. <laughs> All right, we'll settle it. Oh, I will settle it. I'll tell you what we'll do, Milton. Yeah. You tell me one of your jokes, mm -hmm. and I'll tell it to... And I'll tell... Well, I'll tell that to the audience. And, and Jack, you tell me one of your jokes, and I'll tell that to the audience, and we'll see which gets the bigger laugh. Milton style or yours? That's, so, that's all right, all with, right me. with me. Okay, well, okay, you tell my joke first. Would you pardon me? No, you, go right ahead. Young man. <laughs> you tell me. Will you keep quiet? Just oh, 
thing. You're going to do my style first. I'll tell you a joke. I want you to tell it via yell. Watch this, Benny. Watch it. Go ahead, pal. and germs. <laughs> and these are the jokes, folks. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. You know, I just heard a funny gag. Did you hear about the fellow who walked into a seafood restaurant and said to the waiter, do you serve crabs here? And the waiter said, sit down, we're not particular. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> You ready with your style? Let him teach you. Let him teach you. See if it's right. better. put a television set on the stove to see how George burned. <laughs> they not only laughed at it, but they applauded. Yeah, they applauded. They I applauded. saw, yeah. Now, they, yeah. Now, what do you got to say to that? What have I got to say to that? Nothing. The big deal. What does that prove? That proved that my tailor is funnier than yours. Are you starting to argue? Listen to Joey Sangor, a former boxer, a popular Milwaukee citizen, and one of Milwaukee's prominent pharmacists. In my time, I've seen a lot of hay fever products, but I've never seen such response like Alaris got. People come in and tell me that they breathe better and sleep better. Hay fever has taken the 10 count. I ought to know. I was once a boxer. William Cuck, past president of the Wisconsin Pharmaceutical Association, has this to say. When Alaris first appeared in Milwaukee, I did with it what we do with all new hay fever products. I examined its formula. An Alaris contains no aspirin. That's important because some people are allergic to aspirin. I've never seen a product sell as fast as Alarest. I don't have hay fever, but my son Chris does. We heard about Alarest and decided to give it a try. We tried just about everything else, but Alarest worked. And you can quote me. Well, that's the Milwaukee story. But wherever you live, you can get the same results from Alarest. This remarkable new tablet calms the cough, the sneeze, the tears, the runny nose, the itchy eye of allergy. It can take the sneeze out of your summer. Alarest, for allergy and only for allergy. From Pharmacraft Laboratories. And now, the two most exciting words I know. Lena Horn. When the sky is a bright canary yellow, I forget every cloud I've ever seen. So they call me a cockeyed optimist, immature and incurably green. I have heard people rave and rant and bellow That we're done and we might as well be dead But I'm only a cock-eyed optimist And I can't get it into my head I hear the human race is falling on its face And hasn't very far to go But every whippoorwill is selling me a bill And telling me it just ain't so 
and appear more intelligent and smart. But I'm stuck like a dope with a thing called hope, and I can't get it out of my heart. No, not As always, you're just too much. Am I right, folks? Isn't it really wonderful? <laughs> Boy, I want to tell you. Yeah, I, I really mean it, Lena. You're just simply. Uh, as always, I really mean that. Well, thank you, Milton. May I say how wonderful you were on the Dick Powell show? Well, thank you again. Thank you very much. You know, you should make a feature picture. 
Well, isn't that funny you, you said that? I'm, I'm going to. I was just signed by Stanley Kramer for his new production. It's a picture called It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World. Spencer Tracy and about 20 stars. It's going to run about four and a half hours. Oh, don't tell me it's going to be one of those epics about a giant of history like Julius Caesar. Oh, no, 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 no. This is a comedy that I'm going to do. Oh, that's good. Because there have been so many of those epic life stories in the past few years. In fact, there's something that bothers me about them. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I sound off a little bit? Of course not. You can do what you want. You're, you're my guest. Ladies and gentlemen, a television first. Lena Horne will now do eight bars of talk. <laughs> No, it's true. There have been a lot of epics about giants of history in the past few years. The reason is simple. The stories are usually in the public domain. And the lives of the characters are available to any producer, gratis. But how would those historical figures feel if they knew what was going on? If they were around today, what would they have to say? <laughs> a lawyer. <laughs> I'm Ben Hur, and I was played by Charlton Heston. The casting wasn't right. In fact, it hurt us. Charlton Heston, he doesn't look like me. For me, they should have gotten Tony Curtis. <laughs> Kirk Douglas in the movie portrayed me as a slave. But the way he played me really wasn't true. For his acting in the dungeon, he wound up with a raid. In my dungeon, I wound up with a flu. <laughs> them for a million, maybe more. Just call me the Egyptian Zsa Gabor. <laughs> it's a pity. It's an outrage. It's a shame. <laughs> cashing in on all our fate. We, we will form an alliance, the undertake giants of history. Spartacus, then her. <laughs> we'll demand our rights Like other individuals We feel we're entitled to residuals <laughs> And when Hollywood's feeling like taking a stealing from history They will pay us a fabulous fee I never see a nickel. 
of those grocers from the screen. My clothes are getting shabby. I'm embarrassed to be seen. In order to eat, I go out trick-or-treat every Halloween. <laughs> Where the poverty stricken, taken a licking, very mistreated, swindled and cheated, the overworked, overplayed, underpaid giant of history. <laughs> star of Peter Barrett. I helped Claudia Colbert make the grade. I learned six million from Liz Taylor. <laughs> if the picture's ever made. <laughs> Cleopatra, Cleopatra, you're disarming. Thank you. We could have a rendezvous. Just name the place. Well, Ben. <laughs> meet me at the pyramid in a half an hour. <laughs> meet me at the pyramid in a half an hour. Meet me at the pyramid in a half an hour. Meet me at the pyramid in a half an hour. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Cleopatra, Cleopatra, you're so charming. Yes. But it's tough to grow accustomed to your face. <laughs> Don't be a smarty, Sparty. <laughs> Up that crazy river that they call the Nile. If they paid me royalties, I'd live in style. Oh, I would gladly leave with my diamonds and my mink. Because that dirty river... <laughs> Confidentially, it thinks. <laughs> Why should we feel blue? Here's the thing to do. We'll sue. We'll sue. We'll sue Paramount. We'll sue MGM. And we'll sue their cockamamie lion, too. <laughs> Someday we'll own shares in Vinaphone. We'll sue. We'll sue. Oh, our clothes may be ragged and funny, but wait till they hand us our money. I'll wear pearls in my lobes. We'll wear, wear Ivy League robes. Who's Daryl Zanuck? <laughs> Come close to the screen and let's see what makes you sneeze. Ragweed make you sneeze? Cat make you sneeze? Dust make you sneeze? Makeup make you sneeze? You've got allergy. You need Allerest. Let's see what else makes you sneeze. Horse make you sneeze. Goat make you sneeze. Duck make you sneeze. Sheep make you sneeze. What's that? You stay away from these things? On the contrary, you live with them. Horse, goat, duck, sheep. <laughs> Take Alarest tablets. In minutes, Alarest calms the cough, the sneeze, the tears, the runny nose, the itchy eye of allergy. Created for allergy and only for allergy. No cold tablet or capsule can say the same. Take Alarest. Being on 
I really mean it. it's a great pleasure to have you on our show tonight. Thank you very much. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I have been in, uh, in show business quite a long time. I, I don't want to feel too nostalgic about this right now or talk nostalgically, but I'd like to let my hair down on the show tonight. Is it all right? We got a little time? Uh, you know, uh, this jazz is not new to me. I've been in the show business since I'm five years old, and I have the material to prove it. <laughs> it's really, I, I started when I was five years old. Really, my mother... Uh, used to take me by the hand, take me to studios for jobs and pictures. And I was in silent pictures. I was uh, appeared with Flora Finch and John Bunny and Ruth Rowland and William Faversham. I appeared. With... What are you laughing at? Right? You're older than you look, this man down here. Yeah, if you remember those names, I appeared with Pearl White in The Perils of Pauline too. I'm not kidding, no. I uh, I was the kid that they tied to the railroad track, and Pearl White kept saving me. Of course, to this day, a lot of comedians wish I'd have never been saved. <laughs> no, but uh, when, I, when I look around here in, 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 a, in a television studio, uh, with these very wonderful people in the audience, it, it makes you feel that, well, here I am back home again and to one of my first loves. And I've done a lot of TV work, especially this year. A lot of TV work. I fixed three sets. <laughs> uh, no, but, you know, speaking of my television career, I... Went through about 360 consecutive live hour shows. Some of them were dead. <laughs> but, uh, I don't even mean. And I, uh, I was going pretty good in those first uh, early days of television. Uh, for the first six or seven years, I had a very high rating. I had, if I may, be a little humble. In my own way, I had a rating of 83. Of course, in those days, there were only 83 sets. <laughs> My mother owned 82. That's... <laughs> well, I, I really, I was going pretty good in those early days of television until they uh, put somebody opposite me uh, the same night on a different station at the same time. <laughs> you guessed it. His Excellency Bishop Fulton Sheen. Bless him, and he did better than me because, let's face it, he had better writers. <laughs> In fact, while, uh, while I was on for Texaco, Bishop Sheen and I had the same sponsor, Sky Chief. <laughs> so, uh... so I do want to say after all these years, it's a great thrill to get back and do another television show and entertain an audience that I love so much. And now I'd like to leave you, ladies and gentlemen, with this one thought. I've had quite a hectic career every year brought a smile and a tear and I've enjoyed every moment out here for your entertainment if you're low when you tune in the dial and my show brings you one little smile then I know that it's all been worthwhile for your entertainment you know to me every night is an opening night just to hand you a laugh is my one big delight I guess each performer is right when he says there's no biz that ever compares to showbiz those years gee how quickly they flew everyone so refreshingly new and though I've spent 47 with you I give 40 more as long as it's for your
like some deodorants, fresh doesn't promise you eternal romance. Cream, roll on, stick, all fresh does is keep you fresh. When you think of it, that's quite a lot. Till I see you soon again, good night. Kirk Douglas and Charlton Heston for dropping in tonight. Also appearing tonight were Milton Frome and Christine Nelson. Next week during this time period, see the Art Linkletter Show and David Brinkley's Journal in Color. This is Lorne Green. Friday night, I'll be coming your way in a new and most unusual role here at NBC. The occasion is the International Beauty Spectacular, which will combine a showcase of the world's most beautiful women with a full hour of entertainment. Join me for the International Beauty Spectacular this Friday night at 10, 9 Central Time, here on NBC.